bold enough to trade crypto futures and lose all your money? Or are you smart enough to build a bot to do the hard work for you? In this two-part series, I'll show you how to use Bybit's API with Python to automate futures trading. Today, we'll fetch real market data, visualize it and lay the groundwork for your bot. Ready to outsmart the market or at least try? Let's dive into it. All right, besides a couple of standard libraries such as pandas, matplotlib and time, you will need the pybit library, which is a Python wrapper for the bybit API. So make sure you've installed it. What I'm also importing here is bybit keys. That is simply a text file containing my API key and my API secret, simply for security purposes, because I don't want to share it with you. No hard feelings. So, this is also important, you import HTTP and this one you use to generate a client which you can use to pull data, execute orders, take a look at your current wallet and so on. And that is exactly what I'm doing here. So I'm using HTTP, provide my API key and my API secret and with that I'm able to connect to my account and all Bybit API functionalities which we'll go through now. So first of all, I'm just pulling some candlestick data, some historical data. And what I'm doing here is pretty much straightforward. So I'm creating a Unix timestamp as of now. And how I'm doing that, there are a lot of ways to do that. So this is just one of many ways. I'm pulling the current time. So that will provide you some number like that. And this I'm transforming into a Unix timestamp, which is an integer. So you have to multiply it with 1K and then do an integer transformation. And with that, with that you get a Unix timestamp. So if you want to play around with that, just pass it to, for instance, a pandas to daytime function, and you will get the exact time as of now. So long story short, this will just provide you a timestamp of the time right now. Then you take this time and go some days back here. So this is just an example. I'm just going back three days here. You can go back whatever time horizon you want to go back here, right? So what I'm doing here is straightforward. I'm taking the time as of exactly now, millisecond granular, and then I'm just subtracting. I'm subtracting three days. 3 times 24 hours times 60 minutes times 60 seconds and then again do the 1k transformation. So with that I'm getting a Unix timestamp again, which is now minus 3 days. Simple as that. You can by the way also functionalize or, or refactor all that so that you just pass the number of days and this is providing you a Unix timestamp. I'm, I was just too lazy, lazy to do it here but this is the way you do it. Now we take those two timestamps as parameters to tell the candlestick history function to go back three days and pull data until now. All right, and this is what I'm passing here. So three days ago as the time starting point and then the current time as the end point. So this is just pulling BTC USDT data starting three days ago and going until exactly now. This is the interval and this is in hours. So this means that I'm pulling for one hour. So not an hour, sorry, in minutes. So this is for 60 minutes. So if I'm executing that and just take a look at that, I will get a dictionary containing a lot of stuff which is currently not necessarily easy to read. But if you check here, if you extract lists, you see a Unix timestamp and then some structure, which is similar to the current Bitcoin price. And that is simply open, high, low, close, and so on, volume and turnover. As this is very hard to read, as you can tell, I will write a function which is transforming this dictionary and list into a very lucid 
and easy to read data frame. So we have an easier time understanding the data coming out of here. This is what this function is doing. So it is taking a response, so a response from the API, and then it's just going on what I just showed you, the list. And this then just creates data as I just told you. So it's taking the data generated here, then takes start time, open, high, low, close, volume and turnover. That is simply what you just saw, the data, but named as what they are actually are. As it is coming from the API as always as string values, you have to do some data transformations, nothing more is happening here. So this is just transforming the time, the Unix timestamp you just saw into a human readable timestamp. And you will see in some seconds that is way easier to read for you. So you will see this will start three days ago as of time now. So your start time is uh, uh, transformed and then you just set the index to that data frame to the start time. So you have a nice data frame with a time index and a couple of columns. Rest of the data is open, high, low, close, volume, turnover. These are floating type values, so I'm just transforming them into float values. Otherwise, you will have string values, which you cannot work with if you want to do some analysis, calculations and whatsoever. And then in the end, just renaming the columns here to open, high, low, close, volume and turnover. Why am I doing that? just for the sake of what I'm used to. And that is capital written column values. You can also keep those column names if you want. I thought this will give me an easier time here. Then this is a matter of preference. I'm sorting the index ascending. The thing is, it really depends on how you are used to the data. So I like it when the first rows of the data is the oldest state and then the last part of the data frame is the newest state. Now let us test this function to see if it's doing what it is supposed to do. So I'm pulling process k-line data on response and store it into df or data frame. So let's take a look at that. And as you see, you have a beautiful data frame, open, high, low, close volume. It is starting three days ago on the 11th of December and is going until today, the last available data point in time. And if you pull new data, so just keep that in mind, that is the last available price here. So that is now 101.066.1. If you would pull new data now, so let's just execute that again, and then execute that again, 101.066 is becoming 101.1.002 because this is the last available price and it will always pull the last available price here as you pass it to the function as the current Unix timestamp, all right? And this data is pretty nice because you can play a bit around with it, you can visualize it, you can take a look at it, whatever you want. So if you plot it here, you will get the Bitcoin USDT price or, by the way, whatever price you're interested in, right? Bybit has thousands of tradable symbols here and you can analyze them. You can go back more in time. So let's actually do that. So that is very straightforward so if you want to go back five days you should also uh, rename this variable otherwise it's confusing maybe rather look back or something like that uh, so if you change that to five days you will see it's going back until the ninth and so on so this will look like this now then you have the big jump here a uh, couple of days ago back to above 100k and so on Obviously, you can apply a lot of stuff to this data, technical indicators, momentum indicators, whatever you're interested in. Also, statistical measures, obviously, you can do whatever you want with that, whatever you're interested in. You have a very nice data frame with some 
valuable information. So what I'm doing here is just applying a simple moving average just to make the concept clear. So you apply the simple moving average by rolling over the closed column with a 20 day window or whatever window you're interested in pulling the mean. And with that, you would get a chart like this. So if you just pull close and the SMA, then obviously first 20 rows are NAN values because there's no look back. If you plot that, you get a pretty nice chart with a simple moving average. And yeah, this is extendable. You can pull whatever you're interested in, as I said, Bollinger Bands, whatever tea leaf indicators you believe in. Now, just for the record, if you want to have a fancy chart, I will put the code for the for making the chart fancy in the drive. But yeah, that's it for this video. And next video is going to be interesting. Not quite sure if in the second part I'll construct the future board already or go over pulling some WebSocket uh, live stream data. I mean, it's dependent on uh, what you're interested in. So let me know below. And yeah, thanks a lot for watching. I'm looking forward to seeing you in the upcoming videos. Cheers. Bye bye.